Hello, this is Hatija Esgaban, and today I will be talking about site reliability engineering and why it needs you. Before I start, maybe let's talk a little bit about me so you understand where I'm coming from and why I am really looking forward to talking about this topic. I am based here in Montreal. I actually went to university here in Montreal as well. I went to McGill University. I graduated from software engineering in Faculty of Engineering. And I have over 13 plus years of experience in operations and the liability engineering space. I was actually a little bit lucky. Uh, right as I graduated, when I was looking for jobs, I came across a position where um, they were doing a uh, you know, cloud hosted um, application for um, mobile phones, for smartphones, and they wanted to try some of the newer uh, methodologies by then, like DevOps and, and so on and so forth. And I ended up doing honestly anything and everything from build and release engineering to con to um, integration testing, to load testing, to um, deploying software, writing deployment tools, to troubleshooting and doing on call. And over the years, I've done all kinds of interesting and different um, reliability and resiliency um, engineering work and used multiple technologies. One technology that I have been a huge fan of um, from the moment I got my hands on it has been Kubernetes. I'm a huge fan of it. I love managing Kubernetes clusters or applications running in Kubernetes, honestly. And if you know Kubernetes, I think it will tie in very nicely with today's topic. You'll understand why someone who has been working in reliability and resiliency might like it. Um, other things that I love include T and languages. And when I say languages, I really mean human languages, you know, spoken, written, um, signed or otherwise. I am not that fascinated by computer languages. I find them useful, but um, just about that. Now, what is SRE? Um, it is not that well known, I realize, whenever I'm having conversations to get a job posting out or when I'm looking for candidates um, within this field. And I realize that might be expected, given that this is not a field that is taught in school. This is not a field that is that much spoken about outside certain circles, even though, honestly, it has become very much a buzzword, um, especially in the Silicon Valley. Um, it's been around for quite a few years, even though it is relatively new still, and most of the big giant um, internet companies do it. Um, the other point is that if you search for, you know, what is like reliability engineering, you will realize that there are many different definitions, and some of the definitions that are really popular can actually be a little bit opaque to people who are um, outside the industry or who are just starting their careers who or who have not really worked um, in these fields before. The way I like to define it is that I like to define it as a discipline and or a rule um, to keep software and or infrastructure um, running reliably, resiliently and without making people miserable. Now, I think that without making people miserable part is very important and it is actually one of the core aspects of site reliability engineering and the people there does not only include your end users but also include yourself and your stakeholders. The discipline and or part is also really important in the sense that there can be companies that do amazing reliability engineering work but do not have any single employee who has a title called site reliability engineer. While this can definitely be a role that you do, an area that you specialize in, it can also be um, a discipline, a practice that you are doing alongside your other tasks or your official title. Um, it might actually, these practices might be part of the work that you do as part of your official title. And Many people who have worked in reliability engineering for quite a while may not even have had the title site reliability engineer per se. And there are many other terms that go around like production engineering or production engineer, but mainly referring to the same thing. Now, 
You might ask, well, this sounds nice, but, well, why? Again, you know, does reliability, resiliency matter that much? Or rather, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean to run something reliably, resiliently, and so on, right? Well, it is really about running the thing, and that is the operational part of it. It is, again, applying engineering to operational problems because we realize operational problems are engineering problems and the way I use the word engineering here I use it in a very dictionary sense of the word you know applying scientific method that applies science aspect to provide a solution um, to a problem and in this case the problem space happens to be operating software operating an infrastructure now what are operational problems, you may ask, and um, they can be as simple as, well, how is the software deployed? That is an operational problem. Um, it may be something like, wow, we're doing great. Uh, you know, we have seen a 200% increase in our users within a week. We need to scale up. Oh, can we scale up? Is, does our architecture actually work to scale this up? And if so, how fast? Um, our deployments are super slow and our customers are complaining. Well, are they slow because the particular tool that deploys it takes a very long time? Or are they slow because people doing the work always run into various issues and have blockers? So why is it slow? Understanding that and coming up with a solution that increases the efficiency there can be a operational problem. Um, oops, we have an out of memory error with an app and it broke the whole site down. That is definitely an operational problem and we are troubleshooting something, we need to see logs, well I have logs for it, I have more logs for it, and I have even more logs for it, now I have to um, grab through all these and it will probably take me four hours to sort through everything. And one thing you start to notice is the sheer variety of the types of problems you see in operational space. They can range anything from whether a particular application was designed to be scalable, how easy it is or to make it scalable after it was designed not to be, right? You might need to re-architecture things. Um, or it can be about efficiency of the tools that you use, the performance of the tools that you use, or it can be about um, troubleshooting particular issue or the resiliency of the architecture so that a particular issue in a particular part of your system does not bring your whole system down. It could also simply be about visualization tools that you have at your, um, at your hand that make it easier for you to run this uh, system successfully, run this software successfully. Now, you might still ask, okay, but why? Why do we care about these kinds of problems? Why are we really trying to ensure we are running this software or infrastructure and we are running it reliably and resiliently? Well, there are many reasons, but number one is that operating software is costly. In fact, operating software is the costliest part of software development uh, life cycle. Uh, multiple studies on this and um, depending on the study they um, assume or um, estimate anything from like 60% to 80% of the overall the total cost of software development life cycle is consumed at the operation stage because think about it yes you developed it you brought it to life but now it's going to need to live out there people are going to use it and all kinds of weird things are going to happen to it and you're going to need to constantly update it and maintain it. And yes, of course, that part is going to take much more money and time and people. And it is also the part that is costlier um, from a success perspective too, if you think about it. Because even if you have an amazing software, if its operational quality is low, which means it is not reliable, right? So it only works maybe 60% of the time. Well, 
people are not going to use this. It doesn't matter that it is this amazing product. It only works 60% of the time. I mean, see when you're trying to launch an app on your uh, smartphone, if it takes more than like 10 seconds or 15 seconds, do you continue to wait for it? Well, we don't, right? Um, even if it may be a great application. So the operation of the software is very, very high value. Now, we are saying that SRE is going to help us with this, but how does it help us with this? Now, one thing that is really interesting about SRE is that um, while some aspects of it are quite new and um, have come from experiences of some excellent engineers from companies like Google or Facebook, some um, actually come from older disciplines in even different industries, not even in um, necessarily software engineering. Um, in fact, some of the work has come from um, very high risk um, uh, disciplines like aerospace engineering and so on and so forth. Now, understanding risk is very important because then you can understand what is the amount of risk that you can tolerate. And also understand in general, 100% reliability is impossible. Over time, something that can fail will eventually fail and when it comes to software in general one great point of SRE is that accepting that failure is possible that it can happen and managing it and not just focusing on prevention, but also focusing on how to fail gracefully and how to handle those failures. And ensuring that not only am I trying to minimize the risk, but I am also trying to understand how much risk that I can take. It is essentially optimizing your risk. Um, because by managing your risk, you are actually managing your reliability. Now, it means, does this particular system actually need 99.99% .99 uptime? I mean, that is a very, very hard to keep level of availability. That's really, really high. And do our customers even care about this? Do they even realize this? The other day, we were talking about um, availability of even things like um, our internet, for example, our internet services with some colleagues. And we were talking around how most of us are not, you know, every single minute using a metering to understand how fast our internet is. So probably even if our provider is not providing us the same internet speed all the time, we are not even realizing it. Um, does it matter? I mean, if it doesn't impact me, if I'm not even perceiving it, it doesn't. Why should they care? Why should they invest in the extra infrastructure and redundancy that's going to be extremely costly to both start and to maintain for a world who knows a lifetime if I am actually not even using it to that degree, if I don't even have that um, degree of accuracy in my usage. Now, when they hit below my um, degree of accuracy, the risk that really starts um, impacting me, I realize it and I raise my flag, right? And that brings me to the next step. Um, as Harry says, look, 100% reliability is impossible. We need to be as reliable as we need to be and not more than that. And we need to focus on what our customers care about so that we can understand the risks to those better and manage those risks better rather than focusing on things my customers may not even care about or a risk to the degree that they may not even recognize or perceive. The next thing is really measuring things that your customers care about. Now, one thing that is really common um, in monitoring um, for example, is measuring things like CPU. Now, if you're going to do some capacity planning, it makes perfect sense to 
you know, measure your CPU usage or for financial optimization if you're doing public cloud. But if you're just trying to manage the risk, the availability or the latency of a particular app um, that is running in public cloud, do you really care about how much CPU it consumes? What it is that you are trying to achieve by measuring that, for example. Again, I'm not saying there are definitely no um, cases where you should not, you know, you, you would not want to um, measure it. But what are you really trying to achieve? When you have this conversation with people, usually they just want to know if the end user is, for example, observing some heightened latency because of high CPU, well, then why don't we actually measure the latency? Because here's the thing, um, these are usually not very good correlators for the things we actually care about. And nowadays, it is not really that hard to measure the things that our customers really care about. And these are usually um, the symptomatic things that our customers can right away see and observe or experience. Um, because of the performance fluctuations in um, our software. So if we are curious whether our customers might be experiencing some latency because we have high CPU, well, instead, let's measure the latency. And there will be plenty of cases where you're going to have high latency, but not really high CPU, and you'll be able to catch those too. That is what you care about. Not that this machine had a spike in its CPU and well, no impact happened to your users. Then there are other things that we start doing, like trying to understand where our people are toiling away. This is really important because we realize that if we can minimize toilsome work, we can actually make our overall risk calculation simpler. Um, we can reduce our risk again. Um, for example, by reducing manual steps, because humans come with some um, predefined um, error rate to them, and you cannot engineer that out of humans. Humans will always commit some kind of an error rate. So every time that they do that manual operation, you're adding that risk, right? So if we can automate some of these things, then we will actually reduce our risk as well as our efficiency. And more importantly, toilsome work is not exciting work. And over the time, it will burn people out. If you are having people who are on call who have to go and, I don't know, delete some files from the disk because you keep receiving this pressure or alerts, the disk is nearing full, or that they are restarting hosts, that's the kind of work that is going to burn out people. And it's probably, you know, providing a toggle board that is going to cause you to miss actual issues that have real impact on your customers and instead perhaps we could go and fix those other issues um, whether it be disk filling up or having to restart a host at the basic level on why are we having this issue to begin with and if we can fix those bugs um, nobody will need to do that kind of work. As you can see here um, in this again, small scattering of the different um, practices SRE does to get you there to run your software or infrastructure reliably, resiliently. Um, there are a lot of different things that you end up doing that are really not um, all the same skill set stuff. You actually end up doing, um, uh, utilizing different skill sets and doing different things. Um, sometimes you might be doing something that is more akin to business analysis. Sometimes you might be doing some automation um, programming. It is quite a wide diversity of um, efforts. Now, let's say you're an SRE and you're doing SRE. Well, from a day-to-day -day perspective, then, what will it look like? Especially since we emphasize that it seems like quite a variety of things, right? Well, because it is a quite a variety of things, it's really being a jack of all trades. Um, there is this really nice um, diagram that you see quite often online, and it is this nice Venn diagram 
And I really like this Venn diagram and talking about SREs because it's really true. You know, you have tons of code, you have many, many servers, and then you have systems, um, you know, as a whole, um, make part of this, and then you're right in the middle. Um, this means that you may need to know anything about, you know, something about everything. You would need to know maybe some programming. You would also need to know um, some networking. You might need to know some security because, you know, oh, like you were having some um, issues because of some certificate uh, mismatch or there is a bug that is causing out of memory errors well you really have to have a good grasp on some um os stuff or some you know peculiarities of that particular um, programming language um it can involve anything and everything that has to do with software engineering and that is actually fun you know you may end up writing a lot of code or you may actually end up writing not a lot of it um, you may be doing on call or you may not be doing on call, you know. It is really a job if you really like to poke and touch everything and anything. Um, variety, I say, is the essence of SRE. And for people where variety is the spice of life, you know, SRE is a very interesting field to look into. Which might bring you to the next question. And you might say, well, that's all nice, but how do I start to this field? If I'm really interested in this, if I would like to look into becoming an SRE or being an SRE, how do I start? Well, you start somewhere. Um, being a jack of all trades mean you know, you're already jack of some things very specific, right, one trade. Um, and what I usually recommend people is that, let's say you're good at one thing and that thing is maybe Java programming, which is nice, it's a great skill to have as an SRE. Well then look for something that is very, very unrelated to that and try that. Um, and when I say very, very unrelated, you know, also try to keep it in mind that it still needs to be something that make sense within that overall software engineering um, systems, um, architectural pieces and requirements, right? So it could be perhaps networking or it could be security, right? So try to learn a little bit about that. And as you are, you know, already practicing your um, main trade, um, let's say it's Java programming, it might be that you end up having some interactions with database as well. Rather than escalating to a DBA every time, maybe also try to take a pass yourself. This gives you a nice exposure to um, something that is, you know, relatively easy to jump to and have some understanding of. And then over time, you will actually start building up that um, many, many, many trays that you have at least touched and have an understanding of. But you don't, you know, you, you become enjoying it and you start kind of not really intimidated whenever something new pops up and you feel, well, I can do this. Um, the other point is there has been a very big push on SRE, especially in Silicon Valley, and Google has actually made all the SRE books freely available online, so you don't even need to buy the book if you want to read it. And I highly recommend reading them, especially the first book. It's just a great engineering book in general, even if you're not going to do this for a career. It will really benefit you in understanding how huge software systems, distributed software systems work today. And there are many other um, freely available uh, materials out there, um, whether they be online courses, videos, tutorials, and so on and so forth. It's really all just a click away, just a Google search away. Why does SRE need you? Now, here's the thing. SRE needs you because we want to have as many people from as many different backgrounds as we can. And that is good for many, many reasons that you can find in um, 
different contexts, there's a lot of published research on why um, diversity matters from a social and cultural um, or economic perspective. But looking at it from an engineering perspective, looking at it from an SRE perspective, diversity also matters because lack of diversity is actually a reliability issue. You see, when you don't have different perspectives represented in a squad and they're all looking at the same architecture, they're all looking at the same problem, and they all come from not only the same um, socioeconomic group, but also maybe from the same locality, or they all have the same gender, it limits the, the different perspectives that you can get on that particular issue. And there might be certain aspects to the issue, um, certain byproducts that they may not even recognize. I think a great example of this is the relatively recent debates on AI and the impact and biases um, of AI that we are seeing, especially when it comes to minorities and different genders. Um, mainly based on um, how the algorithms were um, initially developed, as well as the training data that has been used. So if there had been more people from more different backgrounds, from more diverse backgrounds involved in that research, someone could say, wait a second, you know, this is not gonna, this is not gonna end up in a good place. And it also matters how many such people you have, because if you have only one or two token individuals, they may not have the capital, they may not have the benefit to um, bring those perspectives as properly as they can to the table, right? So lack of diversity is a reliability and resiliency issue because it is leading to um, single points of failure based on um, specific biases and prejudices. And I especially think this is a huge problem because the lack of diversity is incredibly, incredibly deep in um, any operational field, I will say. Um, it is so in general in engineering, um, but it is also especially bad for DevOps and SRE um, within engineering um, to the point that, you know, when we talk about, for example, women in engineering workforce in the US, at least in the last 2018 report, we were um, talking about 15%, but then think about specifically DevOps and SREs according to Stack Overflow survey in 2019, SREs were 22 times less likely to be as single men. And, and this is staggering. And in fact, um, DevOps was the top of the list there with uh, 28 times more likely for them to be man. And SREs was the second. So um, this is a huge problem we have. And that's why we need more diverse talent. And that might be a little bit intimidating, I understand, but if there is one thing that I've learned from my career and from this um, career path in SRE, it is to not fear not knowing. Um, there is a lot that you learn um, by taking the first step and daring to learn. Um, it is really important to not fear not having the experience or coming from a different background. Um, I sometimes, you know, not so jokingly say, all the best SREs I know are actually people who come from arts backgrounds. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just their creativity or something like that, but they tend to be the ones that are really, really, you know, coming up with interesting ideas and solutions and tool sets. So perhaps you don't have experience in this prior or experience in a related field prior, but you still did, you got interested in it, you tried some courses, it makes sense to you, take a chance. Do not fear the boys club. Just because it currently lacks diversity does not mean that is the fate. That is not something that we can change. No, that is something we can change. Um, I would say dare to be, um, dare to be an SRE. Thank you.